Welcome to the Raising Them Ready podcast. Here we encourage and support parents who are doing the best they know how to raise their kids to become confident, capable, and kind in what can at times feel like a half crazy and often unpredictable world. I'm Jonathan Kathman. I'm a family man, career sociologist, and best slain author who believes our children's greatness tomorrow begins with good guidance today. This week we're discussing moving. Be it across town, cross country, or to the other side of the world, any family who's packed up their belongings and relocated knows moving is demanding and can be especially stressful on kids. As this episode releases in early April, and here in the United States, each April is officially the month of the military child, where we recognize and thank the children of our service members, I thought it only fitting we ask a military family to help us unpack some tips and tricks about how to make moving easier on the kids. So I've invited the Tool family to join me today. We have three of four siblings, Hope, Tyler, and Nate. And as their dad is on duty working, mom Holly is joining in also. Together, they have more experience moving than most as their family of six has packed and unpacked, relocated and repeated far more than a few times. So welcome to a moving conversation with the Tool family about raising confident, capable and kind kids who can make the most out of any move. So how many times has your family moved between duty stations? So is this with kids? The whole family. Okay, this is, I got to do some math. So total, I think it would be 13 moves. 13 Uh, moves as a family. As a family Mm -hmm. since we've been married. Yep, 13 moves. Wow. Hope, how many times did you remember moving? Um, I think six. I did Maryland, San Diego, Virginia, San Diego, Virginia, Greece. Six. six or seven. I, I distinctly remember six moves. Yeah. Nate, do you remember all six of those or do you have more than that? Um, Hope, are you counting Maryland? Yeah, I count Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really remember it. So I was born in Pensacola and then moved to Jacksonville right after. And that's where Hope and Tyler were born. I don't remember either of those Florida moves. So probably. Well, the whole being a baby thing kind of. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was about a little bit. Um, yeah. I'd say, I'd say six too. Sorry. Tyler, do you have uh, any one move that sticks out in your mind? Uh, I mean, of course, the later ones when you're you know old enough to remember it are all pretty distinctive um, shifts in you know how you view things. So I would say the solid maybe the latter five or so I, I really distinctly remember. Okay, being a military family and you moved on the regular every couple of years, what kind of good advice could you give a family now who's staging up for a move? So logistically, I would say make connections to where you're going first, because when you're moving, you're setting up schools, uh, health care, you're setting up, you know, new dentist and all of those things The the logistics of setting up a community before you get to the community is has been the most helpful for me in that regard as a parent. Hope, when your family's preparing for a move, were you already looking towards where you were headed, thinking about school and clubs and friends or? I think it was a mix of, okay, what's going to be next? How am I going to fit in? I mean, we were also homeschooled too. So um, that community looked a little bit different, but there was still that. um, I just had a lot of different scenarios running around in my head of what could this look like? How how am I going to make friends? Am I going to make friends? Um, but then I think there was also this, the sadness and the mourning of this is a, the community that I'm in right now, I'm going to lose. And and so I think even too, as I was thinking about where I'm going to go next, I also thought a lot about the friendships that I was going to leave and whether or not they were going to last. And I, that was a weird thought for me to think when I was 12, 13, just because I think you don't really expect to have that kind of thought of, are my relationships going to actually withstand this new change so nate and tyler jump in here as well is it harder to leave one's place or move into another yeah i think the the answer to that question kind of shifts as i got older i remember the the first maryland move i think that was right after first grade for me i think it was between first and second grade is when we moved to San Diego from Maryland. And that was the difficulty was coming into someplace new there, like meeting new friends, all of that. Because I think as soon as you get old enough to remember the moves, that's when leaving gets gets harder. I think when you start building those connections as you're older, there there are a lot of them that were difficult as you get older for different reasons. But I think leaving friends, it gets gets harder when you're older and you have those more genuine connections. Um, 
And I think that's something that's that's always hard regardless. Um, but yeah, I think the the nature of it just changes. I think as you got older, I think the ability to to be adaptable and flex to new circumstances just kind of improved for all of us. I think because we had moved so many times. Um, by the time you're moving for the fifth or sixth time, you're like, okay, this is just a new environment. There's going to be new people I get to meet. You kind of mm-hmm. reframe it a little bit. Um, there's new opportunities. We get to go to DC to think about all the cool stuff there is to do there. Like things like that get you excited about moving someplace new. And it gets a little harder just to, to leave the things that aren't new and exciting, like friends and relationships and the communities that you've built. So Tyler, I saw you shaking your head up and down as well. Tyler, is it more difficult for you to leave behind or to go to a new space? I think definitely I, I would agree in that the leaving behind is the more difficult part, especially as you get older. It's just like you you build up communities, you build up relationships, even just the simple things of like habits that you get into in a given place. Having to sort of reset all of that in a new environment is always going to be difficult where, you know, going to a new place and starting to establish new things can be at worst, you know, tedious. And at best, it can be like exciting to, to try something new and something different. So as a parent, Holly, when you're seeing that you've got a move coming up, what are you doing to help prep your kids? What did you see over the years? Wow, that we've got to make sure we do that next time we move because that worked really well. That's a good question. And it has varied definitely as the kids are different at different ages, for sure. Because when they're when they're younger, the beauty of having young children between you know, even infants to elementary school, you can get them excited about certain things because they'll they'll buy into what you buy into. So if your spirits are are up and you're you're positive, they will buy into that. That's one thing I know that I definitely put out and it's a new adventure. We always said it's a new adventure and they are um, character building opportunities. Look at all the great things that we're going to experience. We're going to learn new things. We're going to have new friends. And I, I presented the perspective of being positive, hoping that they would buy in and get excited as well and see it as an opportunity rather than a drudgery or a, you know, a, a hardship. And that was part of part of the thing I needed to ex- acknowledge that it is a hardship. And that's one thing that I've learned over the years is acknowledge that this can be really hard, but there's some positive to it as well. So um, the number one thing I would say is I don't regret putting our family in a transient lifestyle because of what they've learned and how they've grown out of it with the caveat that as you go through transition you absolutely have to be intentional and you have to be rooted to uh something that's greater than yourself when your family moved more than most any other family would under normal job circumstances being a military family every few years being having a new assignment and needing to pack up life and move cross country or in your case also around the world that's a lot of work. That's a lot of energy. And that takes a whole lot of coordination as a family. Yeah. The average family is going to move a couple times. And sometimes it's not even cross state lines. It might just be to a different neighborhood in town, but still change occurs. And so it can be, it can be hard. And I like that, that as a parent, Holly, you're saying that it's important to acknowledge that our kids struggle with this. If, if we only paint it up as a, as a rosy, nice picture, then we're almost denying them their need to, to grieve Absolutely. leaving behind friends. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. What's one of the exciting parts about moving? Mm. It's almost a sort of dramatic sentiment, but uh, the idea of almost reinventing yourself, being able to have new environments and new people who are perceiving you in different ways. And so if there are things that you would worry about in terms of like reputation or you know how people are perceiving you, going to an entirely new place gives you the opportunity to try a lot of things that you might otherwise be worried about or nervous about in like, you know, these people have known me, what are they going to think if I do this? But did you ever do that? Did you ever do, did you ever do a hard reboot when you showed up on a new, new place? I I have. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) People wish they could do that. If I could just start over and here you're like, Hey, we get a chance. We can keep the parts of us that we like and, Maybe not repeat other patterns. Yeah. Well, Nate, you're you're 23 now. You're a career man. You have a job. You're working in a industry that requires you to be on the road quite often. Do you think that maybe some of the, the experience you had growing up in a military family that moved around a lot gave you some resilience for the career you're in now? Yeah, I do. I think 
taking this job, I think the the move to Seattle, the transition to Seattle, um, I think having moved around so much as a kid really prepared me and equipped me to do that in a uh, really like effective and efficient manner. I graduated from college in like May of 2021. I took a job in Denver. So I drove from <laughs> my university, Houston, then drove from Houston to Denver all within about a month. Took the job in Seattle about a couple months into that. I drove right from Denver to Seattle. And in my mind, that was like a very like, oh yeah, I'm just moving from spot to spot. Whereas like if to anyone else, I feel like that would be a crazy, like you move three times within a span of four months. And for me, that was a very normal thing. I was definitely equipped for that, having moved around so much. Um, and then the actual job itself, it's something I talked to the other um, coaches on the staff about a lot as they are starting to have kids and stuff like that now too. Um, but I think the the upshot is it's it's make the most of whatever circumstance you're in. Um, so there's a lot of, we are on the road traveling a lot and there are circumstances that come up, especially as you're working within a team. Um, but I think just quickly thinking about like, how can we find a solution and move forward is, is especially helpful. A lot of people are paralyzed by move. Whereas mm -hmm. you've taken the experience and the skill you've built through moving to actually empower you. And it sounds like you've, you were able to get from where you were when this whole journey began of I'm going off into my career now to where you are now, partially fueled by your experience from, from moving around a lot as a, as a kid. And right now you're sitting in Washington state, Tyler's in South Carolina, Hope is in Texas, and your mom Holly's in California, and I'm in North Carolina. So there's a, there's a whole lot of space between us here. And yet I'm watching you as a family and it's like, there's no distance at all. And so I think that also the part of, of the power of a family who's dealing with, with changes or difficulties is you, you figure out how to manage yeah. and you, you make the most of it. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll add on to that too. I think it does require a lot of intentionality. And I think as we are like spread out across, cause I know, I think mom, I think you're in, you're in Houston. I'm in right? Houston. Actually. Houston, excuse me. Okay. And, and mom's in Houston. For, for, for the next three months and then we'll see. Yeah, so she's been jumping around all over the place too, but that requires a lot of intentionality. I think there is a degree of like taking time to text in the family group chat, find a time when we can all connect and come back together. So it's definitely harder as we've all gone on and, and have different things going on in our lives. Like I remember we'd have family dinners were huge growing up. And that was a point of connection for all of us where where else if we had sports going on, we were trying to figure out stuff with a move transition, we were all able to kind of come together. And I really value those moments a lot. It's something that I would want to do with my kids. Nate said building intentionality into mm -hmm. family time is important yeah. when we're dealing mm -hmm. with change, especially if you're moving. And now your family's spread apart. So you had the tradition of family meals together. Yeah. Now you have the tradition of group chat. What are some yeah. of the other things you did as a family that helped bring that, that value, the, the safest place, the best people in the world are these people? What are some other things you did as a family that really helped strengthen your resolve, your resilience? I think about, this is so, it sounds silly, but we, I don't know if you know what I'm going to say, but when we were home and we were just at, at the house, um, we would do like little sock matching parties. Um, sock <laughs> sock matching so, parties. Sock matching parties. Um, yeah, it's and very so, normal. Perfect. I, everybody does that. Know, but yeah. but it's, it's a part of chores. From the mom perspective, Hope, it was, it was a, a strategy to see if I yeah. could get you guys to help me with the laundry, but you lay out the socks and if you could match them and roll them up like a ball, then we could throw them at each other. Right. So then, right. you know. Oh, I thought you were saying you were going to wear the same, like everybody was wearing blue socks today. We all have oh, to match. No. no, you're talking about <laughs> sock chores. wars here. You're talking yeah, about exactly. laund laundry and sock wars. That's different. So, yeah. Well, all the little lost socks, you make a bin of them and then every so often you pull them out and you, exactly. you have to match them. And so... Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's with those like little things or like when we're getting ready to move, we were cleaning the house and getting ready to go. We'd be doing it together as a family. We're, this is our house. We're going to take care of it and we're going to get ready to leave. And um, we would wash the carpets with the, and put bubbles all over the ground and we would be like a little slip and slide. It was awesome. And so the, and those are the memories that stick in my head more than, Oh, this one significant house where we did this and, this is where I grew up my whole entire life. Obviously, that's not a part of our life, but I think moving put us in a, in a position where we were um, just with each other the whole time. And so we'd find ways to just mess around and hang out and kind of make the most out of it. One of the things that 
helped make that happen was just, and this is something I would encourage other parents to do, is definitely involve your kids in the moving process, in the mm -hmm. packing or um, unpacking, um, but also find opportunities to make something that is a chore, something fun and uniting. Mm -hmm. I remember the one time we had moved from, I think it was San Diego to the Havner house in Virginia. And we took all the boxes and we taped them together. We had a huge hill and we taped them all together like a slide and we got in sleeping bags and we just, my gosh, that was the fastest slide we've ever built. And I do remember boxes, like everything you can do with boxes we did. We built forts and towers. Tyler, do you mm. remember the time that we built that snow machine and we, we had all this extra styrofoam from something and we just put a vacuum cleaner on the opposite on the blowing function and just put the kids in the box and just blew mm. them and they came out like they had been covered in snow. I mean, just, it's going to be stressful for you just to know that ahead of time, it's going to be stressful, but find the moments of fun within the stress of the move. Yeah, Cause and the box we, stuff is really just like so distinct. Like I was going to say, actually, like one of the things that I remember most distinctly about the moving process in like, I just remember having so much fun doing stuff with those boxes. Like I, I knew you were going to talk about that slide. Like as soon as you mentioned that move, like, like I remember the slides, the towers, like we just had so many boxes growing up and we always had a use for them. Yeah. So memorable. And it's also, I don't know, I think looking back now, I have like a little memory box of just things that I just have had. Um, and I think there's something really cool when you pack something up, you're gone, you're away from it for like three four weeks and then you move into your room and you open up all the stuff and you're like, oh my gosh, this is my stuff. These are my things. And I get to put them in this new room. Um, and I think that's, and that sounds silly, but it's, I think it's significant. It was significant to me as I was you know, moving into a new room and talking to my sister about, okay, what do we want our room to look like? And that was, that's also a part of making it fun too. Making something your own, especially in a place where it's unfamiliar. And yeah, I think- Yeah, Hope, Hope, that's it. really interesting to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. I remember distinctly trying to create an environment that would feel home, like home to you and- we painted a rainbow on the wall because you guys were, you and Ellie were really into rainbows and it was based housing and we weren't really supposed to paint on the walls, but we did what we thought was best for our family. We repainted it before we moved out. It was fine, but I just remember being very intentional about giving you a space that you felt was your own. And I remember pulling some things and asking you to pack them in the car that were comfortable and familiar mm -hmm. to you, whether they were your blankets, whether they were your stuffed animals, that there was something that was home for you that wasn't a person or, you know, the dog, but that was uh, significant to you that was special and that we could build around that. And I think every time we moved, one of the special things was creating your space. I want to affirm what you've done with your kids in making the new space their space. Every time mm -hmm. we moved with our boys, every time they moved into a new room, the question was, and what do you want this room to be? Mm -hmm. One time my son Cole says, I want a soccer room. And so one whole wall became midfield and it's, it's, it's a soccer green. It's, it's turf green, the entire wall, with this giant white stripe down the wall with a midfield in. And we even built him a bed with AstroTurf wrapped around the outside of it so that it would be his soccer room. You know, my other son's like, I want a stage in my room. I want to be able to stand on stage and perform and sing and play guitar. And I'm thinking that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard in the world. Who put the stage in the room? And where are we going to put your bed? And then I realized, oh, wait, if we built the bed so it trundled out from underneath, he could have this space in his room to put on these performances with his new friends. Parents, I think that that's real important when our kids are entering into new space in the home that they have a place that they recognize as theirs. And it's very unique to them. You go literally room to room to each kid, you should see their personality in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. On that note, like in, in discussing that, I was thinking about how I, I saw that growing up. And I remember like the, you know, Nathan and I shared a room, but you put up those uh, rings hanging from the ceiling between our beds. And I, I think that was that was pretty instrumental in me and my love for like climbing and just hanging and no, but I'm these not. are like like you could grab onto oh, these rings yeah. and and like parkour. Yeah, yeah. That we would we would um <laughs> grab onto them and like swing onto one another's beds. It was you know kind of dangerous looking back on it, but we we didn't get hurt at least that I remember. So I <laughs> think we're good. It should be a calculated risk 
that we take as parents to say, what are we willing to risk in a safe environment? It's doing dangerous things carefully. Yes. Yeah, of course. Oh, we have girl. broken stair newels sliding down the stairs in sleeping bags. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I come yeah. home from a business trip and it'd just be chaos and you know, <laughs> and a lot of fun. And a lot of fun. Let's talk about friends. Like it is always hard to leave behind friends mm -hmm. and move to a new place where you have to make new friends. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tricks you have to for staying in touch and making new friends? The balance that we had was good to be able to still have that connection, still have that security. Um, of knowing that I can still text my friends. I can still um, tell them what's going on in my life. I know what's still going on in their life while also having the new community, whether that's within a homeschool co-op or um, a rec soccer team or something along those lines, knowing that, okay, yeah, you might have left something behind, but here's something else to not replace it, but to also to make that transition easier. Because if we just had been, if we had left, and then had nothing to help with that, I think we would have experienced a lot part of our transition. What about you, Tyler? I would say the biggest thing that I, that I picked up over the years involving moves with relationships and all, the idea of figuring out what I care about in those relationships, mm -hmm. what matters to me, the kinds of friendships and bonds that I, I look to make, that changes drastically when you're when you're moving when everything is sort of up in the air you know do we have similar interests or do we really just get along on that deeper level when you're in the stage of talking with people getting to know them just being friendly having those light sort of interactions such that when you leave you can have that deeper connection that you've also forged during that time um if you just have common interests with someone then once you leave you can still you know keep in touch but it's gonna fade Tyler Hope, is there anything you wish you would have done different in all the moves? Like looking back, say, ah, oh, I wish I had stayed in contact with more friends from the third grade or. There were a couple of friends that I knew that were also in the military, their dads were in the military and knowing their perspective, um, they kind of took a passive look and kind of just was like, I'm just going to go next place. I don't really care about making any friends. Um, and so when I saw that perspective, I, I thought, oh man, like that must've been so much, that must've been easier and you don't have to like miss anyone. But, um, I think I had entertained that idea for a while and I wish I hadn't. Um, and I think it can be easy to fall into that. Absolutely. Because when you move so often, it, it becomes easier to kind of just give in and kind of throw out the towel. I think I, I would have given myself a little bit more time and space to work through each move to say this is really really hard but also there's to be able to have that balance because I didn't have that balance it was either I'm so sad and I'm never going to be able to move on or man I feel like I'm being forced to be positive and like try to give this up and try to like try to move forward quickly I, my head just felt really full all the time and so to be able to maybe just write it out or to be a little bit more vocal with the people that are around me to talk about it. I think I wish I had done that. Each move is gonna be different and it's okay if you still have those same feelings and you should still be able to talk about that. Um, not that I wasn't allowed to, but I think I told myself I couldn't because we've done it before. So why would you need to talk about it again? And as your mom, that was, I felt that was my fault, to be honest with you, because I, I was so much pushing a positive perspective because as a parent, you want to see your kids happy. So you push the perspective of this is a great adventure. You're going to make new friends. You get to have a new room and all of these great things. But to really allow you you guys to sit in the hardship of it, recognizing mm -hmm. that is, is really actually pretty critical. And then you can move through it. You, you recognize that it's hard and it's messy. But I think recognizing the hardship of it is important, but, but not allowing your kids to shut down um, and, and, and hibernate in that state of transition is important too. And families that move on the regular, I've heard this conversation before, families that don't regularly make this kind of transition, I think it's equally important what you said that you've got to be able to express your, your concerns, your needs, your, your, your hurt, or your happy. Mm -hmm. And it might not just be a one and done conversation. 
Yep. I hope you said maybe I should have written some things down or I should have talked to someone or give myself some more time. I think that it's important, parents, that you let your kids work through this, but not to stall in it, but to work on it and to work through it. And one child in your home, it may be a, a quick transition. Another child, it may be weeks or longer before they are settled into realizing and, and acknowledging that this is happening and mm-hmm. or this has happened. But uh, process is very, very important. Yeah. I like that you said that the expression of feelings or expression of hurt or talking to your kids about their concerns or worries isn't just a one-time thing because, and I, I'm speaking from experience, I feel trapped when I feel like there's a restriction being put on me saying that I can only talk about this one time, conversation's done, let's move on. And I think it could be really helpful for kids to know that their parents um, are willing and consistent in creating an environment that has the conversation open at all times. Um, That conversation about your fears, your worries, anxieties, concerns, exciting things, sad things, all of that, that that's a constant, um, and there's there's a constant invitation to talk about it because once there's a moment where it's kind of one and done, you talked about it, let's move forward, then I think the kid is more likely to think, okay, well, I shouldn't have any more other problems. It's all good. But I think to have parents vocalize and say, thanks for telling me. Thank you for coming to me and being willing to share this. This is really, really hard. I just want to, I want you to know that I'm here for you. And, and whatever happens, whenever you're feeling X, Y, Z, I'm, I'm here for you and want to hear. And th- this conversation is always, always open. And parents, I think we should avoid saying to our kids, I know how you feel. Mm. because we're adults. We have different brains. We have different uh, life experiences. Our maturity level is different than a seven-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 17-year-old. To say, I can see that this is hard for you, or I have some similar feelings, Mm. that will hold far more value and weight with your family and with your kids than to say, I know how you feel. Or especially if we disagree with them. Well, you shouldn't feel that way because this is going to be a great adventure. You just, you've just, you know, degraded their, their feelings and how they're, how they're Mm -hmm. managing through this. So acknowledge your kids that this is a struggle and one of your children may love the fact that you're moving. Kind of like Tyler said, I have a chance to reinvent myself upon arrival, you know, and, and maybe this move is a good one for, for that. But the next move, you don't feel the same way. So just acknowledge that your kids are having these feelings, let them, let them work through it and try not to be their buddy in a, uh, we're the same here, be their parent, but also be in a space where they know that you are the safest person to talk to as many times as they need to. Um, Having a perspective of being able to learn from your kids. This is my favorite stage of of parenting actually, as my my now adult kids are teaching me things. And and I'm learning about what I did and didn't do. um, And especially in in my new profession of, working with applied psychology and developmental scenarios with uh, adolescents and and parents alike, I would like to go back and do a few things differently, but I'm also really glad for the lessons that I did learn. And I would encourage parents who don't know what to say to their kids and they're struggling and they're watching their kids struggle and they, their words aren't reaching their kids the way they want their words to, to say, maybe there's someone else. And uh, I know Hope took advantage of that even at church uh, when she was working with just some of the youth workers there. It was a huge help for me as a parent to have a village take advantage of that as parents, take Mm -hmm. advantage of the opportunity to seek uh, mentorship through uh, people in your kid's village, um, whether it be through church or mentorship programs or um, professional mental health counselors. It could be a school counselor. It could be a sports coach. It could be the really cool neighbor that you all grill out every other Saturday with. If your kids have access to someone to talk to that is in addition to the, to the parent, as long as that person is a compliment to the parent, Mm. because it's not like the moves not happening. It's not like their feelings again are going to be a one and done conversation. They don't feel like this anymore. Find someone that your kids trust who they could also bounce their thoughts, their ideas, their concerns off of. That's why I'm such a, an advocate for mentors. I think mentors matter greatly. If your kids have someone in their life that is that trusted, uh, let them seek that advice. Let them seek that counsel from that person. Nate, let's, let's, uh, let's kind of wrap up here, but kind of give me the, um, 
the Tyler. best. Sorry, Tyler. I, I have a hard time with it too. I don't remember them. It's the, it's the middle kid thing. I'm telling you. It's the middle kid <laughs> thing. I look at my kids and we call them by all the names except for their own. You know, I, I, I run down a list. Like, that's my attorney's name. That's our dog's name. Let's say, uh, you, the one, the second one I made. You know, come over here. <laughs> um, Tyler, what's, what's uh, wise advice you could give a parent about prepping their kids up for a move or after they've moved? What would be their big, big positive takeaway? Give a parent some great advice here. I think there there is really valuable balance in being able to process emotions, but not staying in that too long, such that you miss the new place that you're in. So when you get to the place following that, you realize that you have now even more to, to process through uh, on top of what you were originally thinking. Hmm. That's good. What about you, Hope? I would say have grace for yourself and for your kids. Um, be patient with the process. Yeah, it's really easy, especially in that kind of situation where you're just transitioning and there's so much stress and there's a lot of things to think about logistically, emotionally, mentally, and it's very easy just to kind of get things done to get them done. But I think it's also important for parents to acknowledge and realize that this is a, a big deal for them too. And as they're processing their own thoughts and feelings about what it's like to transition, yeah, I think it's important to have grace. Um, but recognizing that each transition is going to take time for you and your kid, um, because I think it's a lot easier to worry about your kid, but also to think about in order to pour into your kid, you need to recognize and take inventory of where you're at and, and how you can best process as well, um, because you want to give your kid your best as well. I trust the tool family shared something helpful that you can pack away for the next time your family prepares for, works through, or settles in after a move. Special thanks to the entire tool family for your love and commitment to one another and to our country during dad's military service. If you would like some more information about what Hope and Holly discussed of how the value of a good mentor helps kids process through the demands of life, I recommend you also listen to episode six of the Raising the Ready podcast. It's all about how much mentoring can make a difference in the lives of kids and young adults today. You can also check out and download our free award-winning mentoring resources through our website, raisingthemready.com. If you're learning from and enjoying this podcast, please let me know by messaging us through our social media pages or email through our website. You can find, like, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Raising Them Ready Podcast and on our website at RaisingThemReady.com. Also, follow and leave us up to a five-star review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you have questions, comments, or suggestions about topics or guests you would like us to bring to the Raising Them Ready podcast, please contact us through our social media pages or website. Again, on Facebook and Instagram at Raising Them Ready podcast and online at RaisingThemReady.com. To read more about raising your kids ready, be sure to pick up a copy of the Raising Them Ready book. It's available wherever you buy your print, digital, and audio books. There you'll also find our other best-selling life skills and personal development books for tweens, teens, young adults, parents, educators, and mentors. Again, thanks for joining me and the Tool family in today's discussion about raising confident, capable, and kind kids who can make the most out of any move. Now go and enjoy the day. Knowing your child's greatness tomorrow begins with your guidance today.